how does financial abuse begin? Well, usually it starts with love bombing. This is a phase of idealization where there's flattery, manipulation, the narc will mirror or mimic their target, their victim. They'll give gifts, attention, rewards, and they act in a way that is perceived as kindness. They might pay for everything, buy you gifts that they can't afford, but they're kind of showing off and getting themselves in debt because essentially they're going to use this later to leverage your finances. It's going to put you in a feeling of, well, you owe them. You're obligated to return the gesture. And I got to give you a warning here. They might not even be paying for the gifts. They might have borrowed money from somebody else. They might have gone into debt to give it. Worse, you know, these gifts can be very empty, not heartfelt. Well, we're talking about an arc, so unlikely that that's actually coming from the heart. There's some kind of agenda or motive behind it to buy you off. And you got to know that narcs have plenty of money usually for what they want, which in this case might be you at this time, but they'll never have enough money for what you want. This person might pick up at the check when you go out with a family. It's this grandstanding looking very generous to your friends, to your family, but it's coming from this heart of manipulation. Like, look at me, uh, look at who I am. I'm a great person. But again, can they afford it or how did they afford it is the question. And why are they affording it? What's the motivation here? They can exaggerate their job offers, their income, their career success, their professional competence to give you a false sense of security in financially partnering with them. And they might even say after a while, well, I don't really see why you need to keep working. I mean, I can take care of you. There's no need. I have enough for both of us. We've got plenty. But the problem is that you're going to have less personal income, which is going to mean that you're going to have less personal power. In an ideal relationship, you could work around this, but with an arc, no. <laughs> no. You're going to end up with less. And you will have to go to them for money, and they will likely breadcrumb you. They will make you explain and justify every expense on their tab, and that's the way they want it. Beware of future selling. A lot of times this happens in the love bombing stage where they will talk about, well, I've got a land sale going through or I've got money coming in. And when I do, I'm going to do fill in the blank for you. Okay. They're going to do something for you. They're going to pay you back. You're going to get a house together. You're going to live happily ever after. Uh, they're, they're going to make changes that make the arrangement even more advantageous for you. So they're future selling you. And some of them might be doing this because presently what's going on is not good. They might currently have a hard luck story. So you loan them money because, oh, they have money coming in. They just need a little bit to get through. So you loan them the money. They squander it and they don't pay you back or the money never comes in despite all these promises and this future selling. Why does this work on women? Well, you know, many of us are socialized to believe that a man will take care of us, right? We see this in all the Disney fairy tales, you know, that this knight in shining armor comes in. And so it kind of feeds this fantasy. Security and stability is a high priority for many women. If it's not, there's probably something unhealthy going on. Most women, highly value security and stability in a relationship. So when a man comes in offering that, it feeds that, that, that need, that fantasy, that value system, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the tools in the shed to make that life happen. And you don't know it because you're getting a bunch of lip service and you're being sold on what's gonna be rather than what is. The outcome of all of this idealization is that it eventually it devolves into devaluation where eventually this person comes to blame you, criticize you, maybe act in a cruel way, in a disapproving way. Perhaps they develop some envy towards you or they in some way expect personal gain. 
Maybe they, again, they feel entitled. You owe them for what they did for you. And eventually they start fearing your dependency. They don't want you depending on them. Maybe they, because they're, they're getting ready to, to discard you. There's some kind of rejection maybe going on between the two of you. Rage can come up. Triangulation where they bring in a third party in. Another source of supply because, you know, you're not supplying them like you used to. Um, they start tearing the relationship down, you down. They're using, or you realize they've been using you. Why? Because ultimately the outcome here is they destroy and discard. You know, on the, on the issue of fearing dependency from you, early on during the idealization stage, they, they don't fear this at all. They're encouraging this because they want to extract all the supply they can from you while they can until you're depleted. And then when you're depleted, then that's where we get into the devaluation part where they're about to dump and discard. Why does all this happen? How does this shift occur? How does it go from idealization to devaluation? Well, it's because probably you set up some boundary or you call them out, right? You say, where's that money I loaned you? Or how come your money never came in that you said was coming in? Or why did you spend the money that came in on something else? I thought we had an agreement. So when you set a boundary, you call them out, you stop giving them what they want, and now they need to go get a new source of supply, which is probably at the point, the point at which they start doing the triangulation for some of you, bringing in a third party, trying to get emotional needs met that they can't get met with you, which is all the adoration, the praise that you were giving them during the idealization phase that you no longer feel for them. And so in the absence of that praise and adoration that they so thrive on, They've got to go get a third party to fill in that blank. During the discard phase, usually it begins with them nitpicking about your spending or demanding to see your receipts and give account of your spending. And you might notice during this time that this person becomes cheap or only spends for show, right? They were really, really generous in the beginning, but now it's a different story. Now you're seeing behind the mask. They hide the money when they see it coming, when they see the end coming. For example, they start earning money paid in cash, or they do contract only work, or they spend it before you can spend it. They will deny you access to your belongings. This is another thing they can do. Changing locks. Let's say you've separated or you're trying to get your things out of their house. You're trying to get away from them but then they change the locks. And then it might even play little cute games, uh, actually not so cute games, saying, oh, well, I made a copy of the key for you, but it doesn't work. Oh, gee, I guess the person who cut the keys did it wrong. I'm gonna have to go back and get it fixed. It, games, games, games with these people, constant deflection. They could even outright just play dead, like no acknowledgement of communication that has been received, um, missing in action. There are no show at court. They move every three to six months so that they can't be served court orders. So they're just, they're playing dead so that there's no accountability. Another thing they can do is use financial and legal ties to prevent you from going no contact. Like if you're really trying to make a clean break from this person, you can't because they have your belongings or, you know, you, you share custody, the child support issue, you name it, you, you've got to keep going back around this person. You can't just make a clean break. They will strap you with responsibility, like your children, leave you to take care of them by yourself and the burdens, the debts, the bills, after taking assets and income for themselves, they will do things like getting an inheritance and spending it nearly all on themselves and then claiming that you deserve nothing. And then they file divorce as indigent to pay you and the courts zero. These are little games that they play. Oh, now you're indigent after you spent $80,000 on yourself and now you want a divorce. This is, this is the kind of strategizing that these people will do uh, prior to the divorce or prior to discarding, dumping and discarding you. They will also flaunt money. Uh, they can use money as a weapon against you 
while you're struggling. I've seen in some cases where they'll go out and they'll get new supply by romantically partnering with, say, an attorney or someone with wealth to weaponize their assets, their resources against yours, keeping you tied up in legal fees for years. Meanwhile, you could be struggling to find a partner because you're sitting there as a single parent, little or no resources, and many prospects are going to look at that and say, I don't want to get involved. Another outcome that you will see with these people is particularly if you have children involved with them, they don't, they don't pay child support because they see it as empowering you rather than empowering their children, which is really the way it should be seen. But again, these people have a very distorted view of reality and it's all stemming from this core insecurity within themselves and their need to maintain an upper hand and not see other people as getting an upper hand over them so if it means starving your kids out of resources to get to you they absolutely will they might claim that they don't have to pay for their children or other responsibilities tied to them because they've already paid enough in their distorted estimation of reality and so you could be in and out of family court with this person until you're ruined financially and or forced to surrender the children to them because you don't have the resources to maintain a household that they've specifically drained you of. And I'm sorry to say that getting out of this relationship, in doing so, you could lose everything. It can take you years to financially recover. I'm sorry to say that, but it is the truth. Leaving and defending yourself financially and legally can become impossible, or at least it will feel that way. And then when you do leave, you end up with much less. You're worse off in the divorce settlement because of all the reasons I've outlined here. Because of all these little tactics and strategies that they go about extricating power and resources from you, acting like a parasite. And people will say, why would you stay in that? which I've addressed previously. And a lot of them will say, I stay because I had no resources and leaving would have made my life worse. And like I've said before, Jordan Peterson has been noted as commenting on this very issue that statistically, people who divorce with children, the majority of them are doomed to a life of poverty. That is just a statistical fact reality. Yes, of course, there are always exceptions. But for the great majority of people, divorcing with children in this economy is very economically difficult. And then you add to that, you're dealing with divorcing a narc. Oh, oh, buckle up, buckle up. And I'm not saying this to discourage anybody from leaving a narcissist. I'm saying this so that if you're not compassionate towards somebody who has stayed with a narcissist, you understand why? What would cause someone to do that? And these are very valid concerns. I hope I've made that understandable here. If you want to watch the next video in this series, then click here. Or if you want to watch my narcissism playlist, click here. Also, if you're interested in my book on narcissism, check it out at Amazon, Audible, Kindle. Links are down below. Till next time, thanks for watching, commenting, liking, sharing, and subscribing.